What's up, Lantern fans? It's the Emerald Enthusiast, the co-host of the Emerald Echo podcast. Here with a comparison video of the DC Universe Classics, 75 Years of Superpower figure, and the McFarlane Collector Edition Day of Vengeance figure of Green Lantern, Alan Scott. I'm going to be comparing these figures in terms of packaging, accessories, and of course, figure to figure. I hope that you find this video to be informative. Here is the packaging on the McFarlane figure. I recently did a review of the Platinum Edition of this figure. As far as the packaging goes, the only difference is the Platinum Edition sticker. Although I like the attempt at being collector centric, I don't like the positioning of all of the accessories. I think they take the focus off of the figure. I do like the silver lettering. On the side it says Green Lantern Alan Scott. Of course there's a partial window and product information. I am a huge fan of Alex Ross, so I am more than happy to have this image as part of the figure's packaging. However, some collectors prefer product shots and biographical details to artwork. Let's have a look at the DC Classics packaging. It has a collector button on this side. It says 75 years of superpower, Green Lantern, and on the opposite side it has the Walmart exclusive sticker. This type of card and bubble design allows you to see more of the figure than the type of packaging that McFarlane used. As you can see, there's only a small part of the figure that is obscured. There is the Ultra Humanite Build-A-Figure piece. On the back, we get a shot of the completed Ultra Humanite as well as the other figures in this wave and a brief biography of Alan Scott. Here's a close-up of the biographical details featured on the back of the packaging. If you would like to read these, please pause the video and do so now. Here's a look at the packages side by side, and although the McFarlane packaging is more slick and very attractive, especially this silver lettering, I have to give a slight edge to the DC Universe Classics packaging. The figure is front and center here. It does not divide the space between the figure and the accessories. And overall, I think that is a better design. Let's compare accessories now. And as you can see, the McFarlane figure comes with many more accessories than the DC Classics figure. Here's a look at the trading card and the stand. And I do like this stand, and I like the idea of the trading card, but I'm not fully on board with the execution. As you can see here, the inner packaging has actually rolled the corner on this card. I have heard that this is a regular occurrence with these McFarlane trading cards. Here is a look at the Lantern. And as I talked about in the Platinum Edition review, I like the sculpting on this. I like the size. However, I wish that it weren't completely translucent. Here is this energy effect, and Alan's hand ports into this. I do like the translucent plastic there. And here is the DC logo peg base. I find these very helpful in balancing figures with capes and Allen's is especially heavy. And here is the single accessory that comes with the DC Classics figure. And once again, this is the lamp. And I certainly like the coloring on this better than the McFarland lamp. It's a metallic green and it looks more realistic. I really like the way that that looks. But even though I like the DC Universe Classics Lantern better, I have to give the edge to the McFarlane figure here simply for the sheer number of accessories that are included. Here is the trading card in a top loader and a penny sleeve. It wouldn't surprise me at all to see collectors begin to seek out graded versions of these cards since they seem like they're vulnerable within the packaging. Here's a close-up of the biography on the back. If you'd like to read this, please pause the video and do so now. 
And here we see Alan Scott, the very first titular Green Lantern, out of the package and ready to rumble. I have always been fascinated by seeing time-honored characters progress through various action figure lines throughout the years, and this is no exception. I am very happy to be comparing and contrasting these two figures, so let's get a closer look at the loose details now. In 1940, All-American Comics number 16 was published. Within the pages of this comic was the first of many characters to bear the name Green Lantern. A creation of legendary artist Martin Nodell, Alan Scott's costume possesses a far different color scheme than that of the Green Lantern Corps. With red and yellow boots, green pants, a bright red shirt, and a light green and purple cape, Allen's design makes for attention-grabbing collectibles. The cape on the DC Classics figure is shorter, and it also features a plum shade, whereas the McFarlane cape is much longer, actually more accurate to the original Martin Nadell design, and the outer layer of the cape is a violet shade. Both of these capes are heavy, so they do create some minor balance issues. The sculpting on the McFarlane cape is more realistic, making it a superior effort. Both of these capes are held in place by an insertion point in the back of the figure. Here's a look at the back of each of the figures, as well as the details on the costumes. Although it is possible to remove the capes, it is impossible to do so without doing paint damage to the figures. Both Mattel and McFarlane should be commended for the amount of detail put into the back of the figures' costumes. Since they are concealed by the capes, and these would have been easy places to cut corners. Here's a look at the rings on each of the figures. Both of these are sculpted well and feature skillful paint applications. As you can see, the DC Classics figure features the ring on Alan's left hand, whereas the McFarlane figure features the ring on his right. Although Alan has worn his ring on both hands during his long history in DC Comics, more often than not he wears the ring on the left hand so I'll give Mattel a slight edge here. Here's a close-up of the Mattel ring, and as you can see, it has been executed very well. I'm very happy with the way that it looks on this figure. Likewise, I am very pleased with McFarlane's effort here. The rings are equal in terms of quality work. The only real difference is the hand placement. Here is a close-up of the DC Universe Classics head sculpt. The only area where I think this head sculpt has an advantage over the McFarlane head sculpt is the skin. It looks a little bit more realistic. This features a slick back hairdo, a smaller mask, and an angry expression, which I think is not quite as fitting for Alan's character as the expression on the McFarlane figure. Here's a close-up of the McFarlane head sculpt, and in terms of the shape of the head, the shape of the mask, as well as the details on the hair, this is clearly a superior head sculpt. Moreover, the expression is one of determination rather than anger, and I think that's more fitting for Alan Scott. Let's have a look at articulation now. On the DC Classics figure, the ankle allows the foot to move backward and forward. There is no articulation beyond that. This figure has single jointed knees. This one is especially tight. So you can get this figure into a running pose, but be careful that you don't damage the cape. The figure does have a quadricep swivel. It is right above the knee. It does look just a little weird when you articulate it. The figure can kick forward this far. 
So I think that's adequate, especially for the time period. The figure has these hinge joints and you can get the legs to go out this far. So that is impressive. You can certainly get him into a deep side kicking pose. And the figure does step back. That's something that I'm always thankful for. The waist pivots from side to side. The upper torso joint will allow you to rock the figure back this far. So you can certainly get him into a good flying pose. And obviously I'm appreciative of that for lantern figures. Although he does not crunch forward very well. There's rotation at both of the wrists, single jointed elbows, as you can see here. There's a bicep swivel and that does help with posing. The shoulder joints are somewhat hindered by the sculpting on the shirt and the cape. So you can only raise them up from the sides this far. The shoulder joints do allow you to rotate the arms backward. So that will allow you to get him into the big power pose. So I'm thankful for that. The arms do a 360, although once again, be very careful. You don't want to do this haphazardly because you may do some paint damage. The head moves smoothly from side to side on the neck joint. The figure can look up this much and he can look down this much. And beyond that, there is no head tilting to speak of. As far as the McFarlane figure is concerned, he has the midfoot hinge, as you can see demonstrated here. The foot can swivel from side to side. There's a minor amount of tilting. You can get the foot to move backward and forward on the ankle joint. The figure has double jointed knees, and this one is also tight. Again, be very careful with the cape. You certainly don't want to do paint damage. The figure can kick forward this much, and I think that's pretty impressive. Let me straighten out the knee joint here. He can also step back considerably, and that's always helpful for ring slinging poses. And he has these ratchet joints that allow him to do a full split, and I'm very impressed with that. The waist pivots back and forth. The figure can rock back that much for a flying pose, and he can crunch forward this much. There's rotation at both of the wrists, and they also move backward and forward, as you can see demonstrated here. The figure has double jointed elbows, and that allows you to get them into this type of angle. There's a bicep swivel, and you can raise the arms up from the sides this much, as well as rotate them in the sockets. You can do a 360 with the arms. Once again, be very careful with the cape. You don't want to do damage. The head moves easily from side to side. The rest of the articulation is minimal. I really wish this figure could look up a little more. There is a minor amount of head tilting, so I'm thankful for that. So I do have some minor issues with the articulation on these figures, but overall I'm pleased by what has been offered here. And now some final thoughts on these figures. If you're strictly a mint on card collector, my guess is you would be happier with the DC Universe Classics figure. Between the figure's more dynamic pose within the inner plastic, as well as the metallic finish on the lantern, this is a more pleasing mint on card figure. As far as a loose figure comparison goes, the McFarlane figure has the edge. It's not just a case of bigger being better, because I don't subscribe to that viewpoint. However, I do believe that the figure is slightly better, especially in terms of the head sculpt and the cape. So if you were only going to buy one of these to display as a loose figure, I would go with the McFarlane Collector Edition. Although perhaps you're a collector of all things Green Lantern like me, and if that's the case, just buy both of the figures. I hope you have enjoyed this review. If so, please like and subscribe. Stay tuned for some articulation shots. And also remember to catch me on the Emerald Echo podcast, which is part of Multiverse Musings, the vidcast. And that's available right here on YouTube. And please tell all of your friends about this channel. I would certainly appreciate it. 
And I'll be back with more Green Lantern related content soon. But until we meet again, this has been the Emerald Enthusiast, and I'll leave you with this. And I shall shed and my I light shed over dark light. evil, for the dark things cannot, the dark stand, things the cannot stand the light, the light of the, the, green, light. Lantern. Of the green lantern. Green lantern.